Uh, our next speaker today is Professor Suvarn Kulkarni of Department of Chemistry, IIT, Mumbai, India. His research is focused on synthesis of biologically important carbohydrates, cell surface oligosaccharides, and glycoconjugates. Are involved in numerous vital life processes such as viral and bacterial infections, cell growth and proliferation, cell cell communication, and immunoresponse, and are thus indicated in various disease states. Very important lecture once again. And this is, uh, he will be talking on the expeditious synthesis of bacterial glycan. Uh, could I request uh, Professor Suvarn Kulkarni to give his talk? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Naveen Kare. Um, and thank you for your very kind introduction. And thank you also for having me here in this very important conference. All the talks are really enjoyable. Um, and we learned a lot about COVID and about carbohydrates in general. So today, as you mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, synthesis of real sugar containing bacterial glycoconjugates and uh, how we synthesize them and what, what kind of applications we can have. So as Professor Kare just mentioned that carbohydrates are ubiquitously distributed on the cell surface where they participate in a variety of vital life processes such as bacterial and viral infection, cell cell communication and immune response to name a few. Structurally, they are, they are diverse and complex and they are present in microheterogeneous form in nature and that's where uh, synthetic organic chemists like us come into picture so that we can make structurally well-defined and chemically pure compounds for biological activity for medicinal chemistry. This is another cartoon picture showing you the positioning of the carbohydrates on the cell surface. And as you can appreciate, they are well-placed to do anything uh, at the interface of cells. And so they are important in, in uh, cell signaling and communication. Well, for many years, it was believed that glycosylation, which is post-translation and modification of proteins, is only present in eukaryotes like us, and it's virtually absent in prokaryotes. But this notion has been refuted, and over the last 15 years, now it is well accepted that glycosylation is present in uh, bacteria. As you can see from this one slide, this is a TEM image taken by Alan uh, Weiner from the Weizmann Institute in 2006. And you can see these appendages on the cell surface of this bacteria bacillus subtilis are the glycans present. Uh, and these glycans help the bacteria to evade immune response and to do uh, uh, cell cell communication and more importantly, the infection. So even though glycans are there in bacteria, there is one difference. Whereas our glycum starts with this N-acetyl galactosamine as a starting sugar, bacteria often have rare deoxy amino sugars such as this DATDH in meningitidase or bacillosamine uh, shown in C. jejuni or fucosamine in Pseudogonus aeruginosa. Also recently, uh, more importantly, the, the presence or absence of these sugars has been shown to be linked to pathogenesis. So they are very important players. Recently, there is an increased interest in uh, deuterionic polysaccharides, such as this uh, tetrasaccharide repeating unit from Bacteroides fragilis, or this trisaccharide from P. alkali fasciis. So to cut a long story short, these, because bacteria have these sugars and we don't have them, they're very important for selective detection, for imaging and for targeting bacteria and also for vaccine development. And as organic chemist, what we need is access to these building blocks, like the blue ones shown here, which are N-acetyl galactosamine and, and, and the colored ones, which are the rare sugars, uh, as orthogonally protected building blocks so that we can assemble them stereoselectively to make these longer glycans and test their antigenicity for vaccine development, one, and we can use the monosaccharides for selective detection and targeting of bacteria. Well, this, is our, this was our thinking when we started our work at IIT Bombay in 2011. And uh, we searched the literature, there were many, many routes, uh, but most of them were giving very long routes, 20 steps routes, and giving a mixture of diastereomers, which was difficult to separate. So this is what we thought. We thought we can start with D-manose, very abundant sugar, and we can do selective deoxygen at, at the primary oxygen, a hydroxyl group, and then we'll be left with a triol. Of the triol, taking help of the syn disposition of the diol, we can then mask the C3 hydroxyl group, and then we can do protect this 
two and four hydroxyl groups as triplets as a good living group. And then we can set up a one pod double displacement reaction um, to get access to this array, all the rare sugars by changing the nucleophiles. So this was our idea. And as I mentioned, this was is comparatively easy to remove the primary hydroxyl group by prosylation and reduction. And the triol, we could selectively mask this hydroxyl group by taking help of the coordination ability of the dimethyl team dichloride in a highly catalytic amount. So this in, enhances the nucleophilicity of the C3 hydroxyl group. And this was, uh, we could do it with the acetates and benzoid. Now the stage was set for selective displacement of the triplet. And why we thought that the C2 triplet will be able to displace first is because if you consider the SN2 attack from the top phase, there is a beta transaxial effect from the O2 triplet group here. Whereas if you consider the bottom phase attack, there is no steric repulsion or hindrance from the bottom phase. So we thought that this is easy. We'll be able to get the azide over here with the inversion. And then we can add a second nucleophile to get uh, the, all the rare sugars by changing this X. So the catch is, you know, once the first displacement is easy, but while the first displacement is in progress, once, the, once this triplet is gone, now the, the top phase is also accessible for the nucleophile to come in and we may get a dye displaced product by the same nucleophile. But we thought that we have a score, we have a chance, we can reduce the temperature and we can change the solvent to get the selectivity. So when we started, indeed when Madhu Imadi, my first tour PhD student, he started working on it, we started getting some dye displaced product. Uh, and so we added excess sodium azide to get this real sugar building of D8 to DH. Uh, for the, uh, for obtaining AAT, this was the key reaction. Then Madhu spent some six months in between and we found out that if we use tetrabutyl ammonium azide and use acetonitrile as a solvent at low temperature, minus 30, he was able to displace only one triplet and that allowed him to add the second nucleophile in the same pot. In this case, it was for taking thalamide to get this AAT. Well, if you repeat these two reactions and you add the, change a third nucleophile to tetrabutyl ammonium nitride, you can then get fucosamine via lateral DAX reaction. And you can then do one more iteration of triplation inversion to get to the bacillosamine. Sometimes you want to connect fucosamine at the C3 position, so you need R group here. And for that, what Madhu did, he, he added water and heated up the reaction to 65 degrees uh, to get this particular fucosamine building block. And the reaction went through orthoester opening uh, to, by mediation of water. And this all worked well, and this protocol was really very well received by international community. And to just to give you an idea how well this works, you can start from a diol uh, to access all the rare sugar building blocks in quite excellent yield or in one pot manner. And you just have to do one chromatographic purification at the end of the synthesis. So, well, that's where we were um, in, in 2013. Uh, we had a very elegant method to start with D manuals and get access to all these building blocks. We also extrapolated this to galactosamine and glucosamine. And what do we do with it? So first we use it in photosynthesis and then we use it for metabolic labeling experiments. And since I wanted to show you some biological activity results, I would go fast now uh, and not bother you much on the total synthesis. Just suffice to say that these are complex molecules having alpha linkages, which are very difficult to install. And sometimes it takes us three to four years to make one compound. Well, so this is, the, we completed the synthesis of these two trisaccharides from many get this. Recently, we also completed a synthesis of this tetrasaccharide, deuterionic polysaccharide, I mentioned from B fragilis. Then we also completed a synthesis of this pseudo trisaccharide uh, from Bacillus cereus. And then this one was more later, uh, where Anand Podilapu could also assemble this trisaccharide in one pot manner. And this has a unique glycerophosphate, uh, glyceramide phosphate linkage. Uh, we, uh, Madhu and Madhi also assembled a little bit larger glycans where you have more different kind of rare sugars. And then very recently, this is work under, uh, we are in the process of communicating this, that, and this we have already published, this chapter of pneumonia. So this synthesis has been completed and we are exploring their role uh, in vaccine development. So these are more complex sugars and you can see more complicated glycans all with alpha glycosamine linkages. Um, uh, then we ask the natural question that are there mirror images of these G-sugars in bacterial glycans? And indeed, when we looked up uh, the literature, we found many, many sugars which are L-form, 
like this El Fico Zameen, El Nimo Zameen, El Ramno Zameen, and El Fico Zameen. And there were practically no methods uh, available in the literature at that time. And the only way possible is the, today's first speaker, George O'Dorothy, gave a talk and he mentioned about the Akhmatovitz rearrangement. That was the only possible way out. So we asked, can we use our method to access some of the issues? And uh, to cut the long story short, the answer was yes. We did the same trick, do a benzoylation at the three position and then do triplation inversion on Ramnos and Fucos, which are commercially available to get all these building blocks and we could assemble them to construct longer oligo oligosaccharides such as this tetra and trisaccharides shown here. And very recently, what Archana Bhera and Diksha Rai from my lab, they were able to show that the synthesis of these two mixed D and L form glycans, so they essentially started from Manos and Ramnos. So Manos was converted by double displacement to Fucosamine, Ramnos was converted to l fucosamine and they combined it to get this disaccharide in a highly stereoselective manner, just alpha isomer, 94% yield. And then Archana expanded this to this trisaccharide from Pseudomonas Arijunasa, whereas Diksha could convert it into this vaccine candidate, uh, which is already uh, uh, in phase three, the staph RS type five uh, uh, over multiple steps. And uh, this is the last example in the proof synthesis which Shantan and Bala recently completed this elegant glycan and now we are going for the vaccine development. So this is all about how you can make these rare sugars and go for vaccine development. The next question is, can we use these rare sugars? Because they are only present in bacteria and we don't have them. Can we use them for specific detection and specific killing of bacteria? So to answer that, we collaborated with Daniel Dube and uh, our first study was on metabolic oligosaccharide engineering. And for those who don't know about what is MOE, this is a slide which shows that in MOE, this is a technique introduced by Bertozzi and Router. And in this technique, what we do is we grow cells in the presence of unnatural sugars. Unnatural means they have handle like azide or alkynes, which are not there in normal sugars. And uh, cells then uptake these sugars by taking help of their biosynthetic uh, machinery and then process these sugars and then express it on their surfaces where you can then intercept this azide, which is expressed on the cell surface by Staudinger ligation, or you can do collect chemistry using alkyne uh, with a fluorophore. And then you can image that cell surface directly. Uh, so this was a technique introduced by Bortuzzi and my collaborator, Daniel Dubey, she was able to show that if you start with glucosamine, uh, having the acetic acid uh, as a handle, um, one can get uh, metabolic labeling, uh, and her technique was that she used the flag peptide with a phosphine. This phosphine will go and bind to this azide on the cell surface. And then you can use anti fitsi uh, anti flag antibody uh, to, to label those glycans. And by help of that, Daniel was able to uh, find out 125 glycoproteins from H. pylori. So we asked the question can we use the same N acetyl glucosamine, which is um, uh, abundant, can we use that to label other bacteria? And so we said we choose uh, this set of bacteria like H. pylori, Pseudomonas originosa, B. thailandensis, B. fragilis, and so on. And uh, when, so the, the experiment was simple to do, take each bacterial culture and uh, grow this culture in this sugar. And we were very surprised to see that practically all the other bacteria, they are not able to express in, uh, this is the Western blot picture that is shown on this slide. They're not able to express any of these rare, any of these glucosamine uh, on their surface. So it, it, it told us that only H. pylori has a glycosyl transferase to process glucosamine and make it into longer oligosaccharide and then express, whereas other black, uh, bacteria like C. jesuli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Bt and MS, they, they lack this glycosyl transferase. So the next question was that, can we then use uh, the rare sugars which are specific to these particular uh, bacteria? Because they are expected to have the glycosyl transferases for those sugars. So then we went back to these rare sugars and fortunately we had a methodology uh, to, to synthesize the sugars. So we quickly assembled the panel of the sugars. So I've already showed you the synthesis of the rare sugars. We just do two more steps. So azide is reduced to NH2 and then you tag it with the azido acetic acid to get these glycans. So the hypothesis was that bacteria have the sugars, they should have the glycosyl transferase, 
they should be able to express on their surface. And so this was our panel. Uh, these are the panel of pathogens, C. jesuli, H. pylori, Bt, and then Simbartan, B. fragilis, and then we also wanted to see if there's an incorporation in the mammalian cell, uh, so that uh, to, to see if there's a selectivity between the two. Because if it also incorporates in the mammalian cell, then it's of no use. So, well, then we started our experiments with uh, metabolic labeling by, uh, and uh, assaying by, meta by uh, uh, Western blot technique. And we were very pleased to see that these glycans, these rare sugar glycans, they, get, they are differentially expressed in different types of bacteria. And the choice of azido sugar substrate dictates which bacterial species will get covered. For example, if you use AZ, which is not a rare sugar, it only gets incorporated into H. pylori, whereas bacillosamine gets incorporated into H. pylori, but shows a very different phenotype in C. jesuli and another different phenotype in B. thailandensis, whereas DAT is not expressed at all in, in BT and none of the sugar is expressed in the Simbartan factor order. So we were very excited with this result and we wanted to see what happens in the host cell. And in the host cell, as you can see from, uh, also there's a Western blot, but I wanted to show you the more sensitive technique, flow cytometry, where you see uh, the signal below, uh, the background signal showing that these rare sugars are not internalized in the host cells. So take home message from this work was that these rare sugars are selectively processed by a select group of pathogens and they're not going into beneficial bacteria and mammalian cell. And it depends on what kind of azido sugar substrate we are using. Based on that, we can selectively label that particular bacteria. So with this, this great result, we went ahead and if you're interested in this work, if it is not clear from my uh, presentation, you could please look up this paper. This is the cover picture of that particular issue in ACS chemical biology. So what we are saying here is that we are exploiting the species selective dis differences in carbohydrate synthesis pathways, particularly the glycosyl transferases present in each bacteria. And this allows us to do selective labeling of pathogen by using unnatural sugars. And we can image the infection in the gut the million dollar question is that can we cash on this result and get selective targeting of the bacteria because now you know we all use antibiotics and when we use antibiotics we end up killing good bacteria together with the bad bugs so the question was can we now we know we can reach out to the bad bacteria can we attach something to that and kill those bacteria so we did a lot of studies and i would just show you two types of metabolic inhibitors that we, uh, uh, we are successful in getting and we are very happy about it. And uh, so this is the idea. The idea is that H. pylori or any bacteria, it needs its fully, fully grown glycan for doing infection and, and maintaining that infection. And this is not something new that we are, we are thinking about, that if we can inhibit the glycan biosynthesis, we get a truncated glycan which has impeded fitness and bacteria is not able to infect. Now this is, this is a very age old uh, understanding about, about the bacteria and based on this understanding, people have come up with, a, with a antibiotics like penicillin, like vancomycin, but due to the multi-drug resistance, there's a need to create narrow spectrum antibiotics. So we thought that, can we truncate selectively the glycan of H. pylori to impede the fitness, okay? And for this, we thought that we can resort to two types of uh, analogs inhibitor analogs. So in that we will we'll have the benzene analog and how benzene analog will, will, will work. So this will compete with the, with the protein in glycosylation. So you have a natural donor that goes on the protein in glycosylation. If we add this, this acetates will go off by esterases and this hydroxyl group will compete with the hydroxyl group of protein and the glycan assembly will get diverted on uh, our benzyl glycoside, which will not be able to express on the surface and as a result, we'll be able to truncate the glycan on the surface of the bacteria. The second type of analogs, we thought that we can add a fluorine group at the site of glycosylation. So fluorine is a, gives a hydrophobic polarity. And the idea is that this will get converted into glycosyl donor by, by, by the bacteria. And the bacteria will use it for the glycan assembly. But the glycan assembly will stop here. And this is not, again, something new idea. You know, Sanger has done uh, uh, for the HIV treatment when the they came up with this drug AZT and the same idea that you put something um, which will not allow you further glycosylation. 
So the, with this idea, we, we went ahead and very quickly, I will take you through the synthesis. So the benzyl glycosides were made from, uh, from the rare sugars by Kavita, uh, by just using the glycosidation with benzyl alcohol and then deprotection. Whereas the chloroglycans were more difficult to synthesize and Ankita and Kavita, they did a remarkable job. Now this is sequential SN2 inversion. So you first invert the two position, then you invert three position, then you invert the four position and then you double invert the fourth position to get all these analogs. And once we have all these analogs in hand, now, so this is the idea. So we thought that we will use, first use the AZ, which we know that gets incorporated into our, uh, into H. pylori uh, very well. And it gives a very nice metabolic oligosaccharide engineering signal in Western blood. And then if we can come up with a, with a rare sugar analog that inhibits the glycan biosynthesis, we will co-administer that in the second experiment. We will add both of them together. We'll grow cells in the presence of both of them in increasing concentration of the rare sugar. And if our uh, sugar gets truncated, we will see diminishment in the MOE based signal. So we wanted to now use our first result as an assay for, for analyzing the truncation in glycan. So this slide shows you what, what is expected. So this if in the absence of inhibitor, we will get uh, MOE labeling like this. In the presence of inhibitor, we were expecting that we'll get a clean uh, uh, Western blot plate. Indeed, when we tried these analogs, you can see with the benzyl back compound, this compound, there was a uh, dose dependent diminishment of the signal. And at two micromolar concentration, no glycans were seen on the surface. Similarly, where all, some others did not work, but then benzyl fuconate worked to give us diminishment of signal and also FDAT, the fluoro compound also gave us dose dependent signal. And then we went to the lectin assays. I'm not uh, showing you the results here, but just uh, you trust me that we showed lectin binding assays to confirm that the glycosylation is altered on the surface. So with this confirmation, we asked the next question. Okay, the glycosylation is altered. What is the effect on the growth biofilm formation and motility, which is absolutely required for H. pylori to colonize the host and sustain infection. And for that, we used, we take to help of OD600 to check the growth, crystal violet staining for biofilm formation, and hello on soft agar to check the motility. And this is a very beautiful uh, result that I wanted to show you that if you see these two analogs, fluorodad and benzyl basilosamine, this is the wild type, the black one is the wild type, you can see how it grows. And in the presence of this FDAT and benzyl back, the curve is just flat, meaning there's no growth uh, allowed uh, by the rare sugars. And if you look at the uh, biofilm formation, this BN back and FDAT shows, showed a very clear uh, lack of biofilm. And also, this is the agar gel experiment for checking the motility. We saw diminished motility. You can see BN back here as compared to BN glutenate and fluorodat here. And even compared to the mutant of the glycosyl transferase, it still showed better activity. So this is a very exciting result. And also with the fluorofluconac, you can see this is a wild type. And this is a, with the fluorofluconac, you can see uh, also the, the, the agar gel and also good biofilm formation. So we identified these three inhibitors that allowed us to truncate the glycan of H. pylori and also showed the defects the growth defects, motility defects, as well as biofilm inhibition. So with these results, we went ahead and um, so uh, we checked the other glycan. So in case of CJs, we do, you will be surprised to see that there is no effect whatsoever. No change, appreciable change, no change in the agar gel, no change in the biofilm formation. So the analogs that were good for H. pylori, they are not good for CJs. And so we checked in the symbiotin, um, like beef fragilis, and we saw that some other sugars like uh, 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 fucunate or AAT, uh, they showed us uh, some subtle differences, variation in some of the some of the glycoproteins. So taken together, I think uh, what we believe this is the first example using MOE and unnatural monosaccharides to inhibit bacterial glycome, and this is a strategy whereby we are taking their sugars, the bacterial sugars. And we are using it against them. And we are trying to selectively disarm the bacteria. I won't dare to say we are killing the bacteria, but I would say we are selectively using their weapons to disarm them in a mixed population. 
So the idea is that these inhibitors will make them vulnerable to our host immune system because they, we are slowing down the growth and we are not allowing them to form the biofilm and we will make, we'll make them more sensitized to antibiotics. And where we go from here, so we want to, we are going progressing towards the development of narrow spectrum antibiotics against high priority pathogen. And the beauty of this technique is that we don't need any structural information beforehand on either glycosyl transferase or glycoproteins. In fact, this technique allows you to find out more about glycosyl transferases and glycoproteins. I think, uh, uh, so now this is uh, our next, this is where we are going now. We want to expand our horizon. We want to test gram positive uh, bacteria as well like Staphylococcus and uh, remaining gram negative bacteria. And the work is under progress and I'll be able to tell you more next time we speak. So I hope in this 25 minutes I'm able to tell you uh, that you can start with simple sugar like d manose You can convert it by simple SN2 reactions into bacterial rare sugars. You can make longer glycans and check their efficacy for vaccine development. And then you can use the monosaccharides and use them for metabolic labeling for glycan synthesis. I think what remains for me is to thank the real heroes of this work. Obviously, I have not done a single reaction in the lab. I'm just a spokesperson uh, who is able to speak on their behalf. I'm, I'm very grateful to my team. This was my first team. Madhu Emadi started the work, went to work with Peter Sibuger at Max Planck and got a job in Vaxilon. Somish followed, followed him. He did all the work on the L sugars, by the way. Madhu did on the D sugars. He's also now in Vaxilon after working with Peter Sibuger. Anand Podilapu, he did this trisaccharide tetrasaccharide synthesis. He worked with Nikolaou and then he's working with MGP in the United States and other people are working with, uh, uh, on other projects. And this is my current lab and I especially want to extend my thanks to the four people, Diksha and Archana, for their recent work on the staff RS, um, you know, Lycans and uh, Kabita and Ankita especially. So Diksha is here, Ankita and Kabita for their work on the inhibitors. And uh, funding agencies acknowledged. I would like to thank Daniel Dubey, uh, who did all the work on the cell based assay. We just synthesized the compound and they did the biological study. So, very thankful to her. And again, I'm very thankful to Professor Navin Kare for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak in this important conference.